Hi, I'm Garrett Fowler and the Chief Operating Officer for ResFrac. I'm Mark Bohorich, uh, former founder of Q Engineering and big time reservoir nerd. Uh, excited. Well, Garrett, thanks for sitting down with me. Uh, here at Evolve, we're talking about uh, what makes the next thing better. So uh, I'm evolution, excited. So to say. Evolution is, is <laughs> I think, implied in that. Um, and, you know, it's exciting to sit down and talk to you in particular because you and I actually have spent a lot of time brainstorming in cafes, not conferences for for the last several years, it's been fun to watch you uh, go from uh, next thing to next thing. And I think centering around the same general vortex of how do you model and make better decisions, um, what led you to ResFrac and what are you doing? Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think as you said, it all revolves around the similar uh, theme, which is the subsurface, this mystery that we're always trying to find it more about, you know. Um, we're interpreting these diffusive signals from all over and we're trying to like form that into a coherent picture. And there's a variety of methods, a variety of approaches. And with ResFrac, we're looking at uh, hydraulic fracturing and we really feel like that's uh, the direction that industry is gonna continue to go, uh, despite maybe some naysaying, but it's incredibly exciting looking at uh, where that technology is, the leaps and bounds it makes from year to year, mm -hmm. and that continued march uh, just continues to progress every single year. We see new innovations, people trialing new things. And it's a really exciting segment of the industry to be in. So what we're doing with ResFrac is we're coupling what have traditionally been three separate s software silos into a single coherent modeling package. Okay. And the idea there is that you can simulate the entire life cycle of one of these unconventional assets in a single model, avoid the export import process that has historically been the status quo, uh, and you get better answers. You get better workflows, you get more efficient workflows, uh, and you're, you're preserving the realism of that system. And so I'm, a, I'm an operator, I've got a field, I've got uh, a development schedule that before I start drilling, I really wanna make sure is, is, is working. Uh, am I signing up and buying your software and then modeling that on my own? Is this like a kind of a partnership where we're working with uh, your team to uh, come up with the best plan? Like how do you work with your clients and what what angle do you take in all of that? Sure, yeah, we have a variety of engagement modes. I think core to all of those is, is kind of a central process of making sure that we're tightly aligned. Whether the operator is doing that work internally through like a licensing model, we, we su sell subscriptions and usage-based licensing to the platform. Uh, or we take that in-house. But even if we're doing a consulting project, we follow uh, a progression that makes sure that we're closely in sync with that operator because one of the consistent feedbacks we heard uh, as growing the company was you know, kind of the, the disconnect where you would just offload a bunch of input data and then three months later a consultant comes back with an answer and you don't know whether it's really grounded in reality and what assumptions were made. Uh, so we really structure around like a, a, a tight uh, collaboration with with all of our operator partners. So what's really driving the question? Is it is it do I do I make an extra you know you know one percent and out of the oil in place in terms of recovery factor? Is it is it really kind of how do you allocate capital to uh, achieve net present value goals? Is it uh, you know how do you uh, you know save completion dollars uh, to make them most effective? Like what, what, what questions are you answering in bulk on, 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 for the most part? Yeah, so I mean, it, the, the pithy answer that you always get when you go to a customer is like, what, what do you want? Well, I wanna save money and make more oil, right? It's like, great. <laughs> uh, but really the way I view it is there's, there is this continual innovation cycle uh, where people are continuing to improve on both fronts, right? Like we've seen, cost per foot of lateral dropping drastically. Sure. Um, there was a, a paper from Bailey et al. that showed a 50% productivity increase per foot lateral in the Eagleford, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're doing both right now. And, and the questions that ResFrac helps uh, our clients answer is, what should you be trying next, right? Putting some physics behind that uh, natural investigation and 
experimentation process where you know you shouldn't be shooting from the hip but that should be based in physics and then you can start optimizing on thing so you have the idea that okay maybe i don't need as much propent because the guy over the fence pumped less propent well do you know the rock is the same do you know that what injection rate he was pumping at do you know what uh, degree of limited entry or per friction he was using right all of those are components and so that's why if you put that all into a coupled model you can actually start to optimize yeah. so so how does it how is it different from you using you know frac pro and you know and then moving it into a, a reservoir simulation and then uh, you know modeling whatever production comes out of that with you know kind of a material balancer pick your pick your flavor uh, what what uh, what are you doing differently or maybe is it just the workflow smooth smoothing that you're doing or is it are you really bringing some extra um, intellectual property to the to the to the debate yeah so our our co-founders uh, Mark McClure and Charles Kang they're both uh, PhD grads that I went to school with and phenomenal and that the root I think impetus of the company is realism mm -hmm. the fact that it yields workflow efficiencies is, is beneficial right but uh, what Mark originally uh, conceptualized this this coupling and integration of all the physics because traditional techniques were giving the wrong answer right and so let's take a simple example of a fracture uh, we all have, you know, we can picture this crack in the subsurface. We put sand in that crack to prop it open. That sand is not a, a binary distinction, right? It's not no sand versus some, like, sand. There, there's a gradation. Uh, we t typically think of that as, like, pounds per foot squared in, term, in, the, in the fracture. So if you use a traditional workflow and, say, use something like Frac Pro or Gopher or one of the other fracture simulation packages, to do that export process, you somehow have to make a binary distinction in your fracture, or maybe you, you gradate it a little bit more, but you're making these finite decisions of, okay, this part of the fracture has propent, this other part doesn't, and I'm going to ascribe some sort of different uh, permeability multiplier to that grid cell that I'm then using in my reservoir simulator. Yeah. Whereas in reality, it's a continuum. So that, that, that the lowest level, that's maybe the, the distinction. So how does that Im impact then your, your workflow? Well, uh, you say over time, right, the contribution from various parts of your fracture are changing yeah. because of that co the nature of conductivity. That's going to impact it. Then even more so, think about like a child well mm -hmm. and you're intersecting fractures, you're hitting those fractures. If you've taken a frac simulation, put it into a reservoir simulation, there's no longer a semblance of fractures. Yeah. And instead you're representing that as like matrix elements, rock elements in your simulator. So they can't capture the dynamism of two fractures intersecting. What's going to happen is that existing fracture is gonna repressurize, it could redilate, propping can remobilize. Uh, there could be chemical effects uh, and imbibition happening in that fracture. None of that's being captured in the traditional tools Okay. And it's all being captured in ResRack. Okay, so I, I get the specificity argument and that really, you know, you, you have all of these knobs and buttons and tools that you can then use to capture what, what really is happening down hole. And then on the other hand, you kind of have, you know, ham-fisted is, is not really the right term, but, well, we're going to do a pad this way and then we're going to go over here and do a pad this way and then we're going to do a pad that way. Uh, you know, what, what are the, the pros and the cons in, that you've seen in both styles of experimentation uh, and what kinds of what kinds of results are you able to come out that maybe are surprising if you go down road a versus you know uh wh how you would recommend going yeah i mean i would i would say one of the the consistent challenges that operators face uh is that there there's very little certainty in this industry yeah. right? um and and you have more ideas than you can uh test in a statistically significant manner, right? In a perfect world, you would take a well design and you'd try it seven different times somewhere, and then you'd run, or not seven, 700 times, right? And then you'd run a statistical regression, and you'd see the exact impact. Uh, and so I think one of the benefits our customers re realize is being able to quantify and predict what the impact of each independent variable is, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's very important when trying to march up this progression curve, trying to get more production per lateral foot, trying to see what the results of 
reducing your capital expense are, you know, what po you made three changes, which is that change that's actually impactful? Is the average operator collecting enough data in their normal course of business to run a, a coherent model, or do they really need to add a significant amount of science to these wells in order to really drive the full value? Uh, I, I think the average operator is, um, you know, either through data trades or through their own kind of science pad or science drilling. Uh, they collect enough diagnostics, and what we see is that those diagnostics are reasonably extensible mm -hmm. over a region, okay. right? So you don't need to be running micro seismic on every single well. You don't need to do geochem on every single well, but doing that on a selection of wells or through data trades really enlightens a lot of the information that we feed into models and can calibrate and constrain than the results before we bring those into a predictive mode. So what's your, what's your advice to uh, you know, the, maybe the independent operator who's got a, uh, a, a set of, of acreage that they are now sitting on? Maybe their initial goal was to drill a handful of wells, prove up the presence of hydrocarbons in the general uh, average values and then flip it to somebody who would do the science later on. Do they have, do they have options? Like is science even possible uh, for, for somebody like that? What is that? How long does it take? You know, in my mind, a reservoir simulation is months to get an answer for one well. And by then you're already, you know, so far down the road. Like what is, are there some shortcuts or maybe some general rules of thumb that you've been able to un, under, uh, to discover like, you know, just pump more sand and you're fine? Or like what, <laughs> like, what like how do you, what, what have you seen that would be helpful to, to, that, to that operator? Yeah, well, you know, I, my, my generic answer always is let's model it, right? <laughs> um, but uh, sure, there are some, some trends and, and taking a step back, like the, the highest level of recommendation I would, I would say is the, the operators that we've seen be most successful are those that really embrace like the scientific method. Right, so what am I trying to achieve? Make a hypothesis and then assess the results against that hypothesis. And uh, what we've seen certainly in the last decade and even just last few years since we, we stood up ResFrac is some trends that are, are pretty consistent across many basins. So uh, limited entry, mm -hmm. right? Uh, raising that per friction, concentrating on, on uh, perforation and cluster efficiency. Uh, and, and getting those up with higher back pressure. Uh, I would say really being diligent about permeability estimates sure. because it has just such a overprinting impact on well spacing, cluster spacing, fracture driven interactions, frac hits, whatever you want to call them. Do, do most people end up being a little bit too high or a little bit too low on those when, when you first start a model? Painting with a very broad brush, I would be tempted to say I see more permeability overestimates. Than what? Under shocking! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not that broad of a brush. Well, it's uh. not. It's, <laughs> it, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to model because you're trying to match a curve. Um, and it's easiest to change the variables maybe that you understand the best and permeability is something you can inherently, you know, translate. Uh, so it, when I was modeling reservoirs, at least it, it was an easy one to, to, to tweak. Um, sure. Well, and it ties over from conventional to unconventional. Sure. So those making the transition, permeability is a familiar parameter. Yeah. Easy place to go. So uh, has this, has your technology been tried in, in one particular area, in one particular you know, county, and, and have you seen those results kind of ex extend into other uh, developments or plays, or, or are they, or you just kind of have a, a, you know, a, a fruit salad of, of inputs at this point, all looking promising? Yeah, so one of the advantages of what we do is that it's a physics-based model, right? And so it, it's broadly applicable and not not a function of the training data that you throw it and put into it. Uh, and so since uh, launching the co company commercially back in 2018, we've worked in every major North American basin, uh, Vuak Muerta, one overseas, uh, and every single application has been successful yep. uh, uh, of ResFrac in terms of modeling and, and seeing that. And we do see different trends in different industries, right? Because right. the rock is different right. in, in different bases. Basins, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, because the rock is different and, and things change. So again, just like coming back to that permeability um, comment, right? We, one of the common ways to get a permeability estimate is through a diagnostic fracture injection test, DFIT. 
Dr. Mark McClure, one of the co-founders, he's published quite a bit about this. There is a possibility to, uh, in a gas shale, to interpret a defit in an incorrect way that would yield a permeability esti overestimate of like two orders of magnitude or three orders sure. of magnitude. Um, and that is certainly a difference then between gas and oil, uh, just because of that inherent uh, assumption or input data that you're putting into a model in terms of permeability. Uh, and then th different fluid types, um, ash beds, right? So um, there is a couple kind of exploration uh, cutting edge plays now that really have to deal with a lot of um, uh, ash. And, and that's going to have a very different dynamic on fracturing. Yeah. Uh, and so that's going to yield a different result. So sure. um, that's where I'll be very curious and, and hope to play a role in, in the international expansion of hydraulic fracturing because the rock's just so much different, right? So I, under, I totally understand modeling and simulation from a, from a front end exploratory uh, process. I think that is, you know, that, that is very well understood. But if you've already got your field, you've already drilled a handful of wells, you have a lot of data, is modeling an appropriate exercise at that point? And if so, you know, give us some boundaries. Like, are you, are you talking about like a percent improvement? Are you talking in terms of production per well? Are you talking about maybe you know, percent improvement in terms of cost reduction through optimization? Like what, what variable are uh, clients who undertake a significant amount of, of simulation in order to solve these problems? What variable do they tend to end up tweaking? Sure. Well, let's start high and then, and then go detailed. I mean, if we just return back to that original citation I talked about at the beginning in the Eagleford with a 50% improvement in productivity, that was over a six year period. And heavily influenced by propent, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, what if we'd done that in one year? Yeah. And I think that's what modeling helps you do, right? Is you, some of these changes, like it, it took us how many years to discover limited entry? models could have predicted that, right? And see so if you had applied models earlier on in that development, you can accelerate that innovation cycle. Yeah, but we also, we already have a, a good mechanism as an industry for learning lessons from each other. We have a lot of public data. We can see easily what's happening across the fence. We can measure that. There, it does take time to see how good a well really is because the IP isn't necessarily correlative to, uh, uh, to total EUR. Um, but over time you can, and there is a body of data across the whole industry, can, do you feel like just as a matter of practice, operators really should be running simulation as a matter of course, or do you think that it, it fits in some situations but not others? And you know, what, what is somebody who maybe doesn't have a, a science budget to become your client, what do you tell them to do? So maybe we'll start by giving that the exact anecdote and going small, which is, you know, QEP uh, published a paper with us at Urtech in 2019, uh, where they were able to reduce well cost by 5% while maintaining or actually improving production of their wells. Uh, and that simulator, I think, gives you the confidence to execute on a novel idea. Mm -hmm. To your point, yes, you can look across the fence, you can do statistical studies, you can go to drilling info, look at some uh, trends, but you are living within the bounds of what's been done, right. right? And I think that's where a simulator really helps you explore outside of, of the historical trends. Yeah. Look at what hasn't been tried. Uh, maybe you're, there's something there. So uh, just dynamically in the industry, we obviously have a, cer a certain amount of scale going on uh, in terms of the, the larger, uh, larger companies may, you know, merging or making offers or a lot of corporate uh, dev uh, M&A. On the smaller scale, we've got uh, a lot of trying to figure out what the next oil price is going to be. Some deals are certainly happening, but coming out of a very slow M&A season, do you think that's the time to really advance the science of these reservoirs to really drive productivity? Do you feel like it's relatively dormant to a time when there is a lot more, you know, net rigs running in, in, in a curtain basin. Like how are you getting new leads from different types of clients than you maybe have before? Like what is the dynamic of the industry really doing to the science of, of reservoir modeling? From a reservoir modeling standpoint, I think we're kind of in this Goldilocks zone, um, which is if we just use oil price as a, anecdote or, or kind of um, canary for the, the health of the industry more generally. Uh, prices go too high and everyone's chasing rigs. Yeah. 
and, and very little science is being done or, or it, it's hard to get science because you're so concentrated on operations. Uh, budgets go too low, everyone sees the importance of optimization, but uh, budgets are curtailed, they, ha they can't try something new. They're, they often fall upon what's worked in the past. Uh, whereas the environment we're in right now, I think is actually very conducive uh, and that Goldilocks zone for modeling, which is we have a lot of historical science data uh, and now we're not so pressed by chasing a rig. Now's the time to go back to that, that data we've already collected sure. and, and really try to get as much value out of that as we can, yeah. uh, which is not necessarily buying new, new uh, science. Right. I mean, sometimes we do recommend that and, and I, I love it when people uh, do science projects and they, they grab that data for us, uh, but it's, not, it's often not required. A lot yeah. of that data exists still. So you think that really, you know, is this, is the timeline from start to finish, you get a phone call, let's talk about this particular project, we want to optimize our design strategy for the next time oil uh, goes above 65 or 70 or whatever it is. Um, you know, is this like a three month start to finish engagement usually? Is it six months? Is it, uh, you know, maybe surprisingly short? Or like what, what, what's the general bite for a modeling exercise like this to really get some good answers? Assuming you already have the data somewhere. Yeah. Uh, ballpark, I always quote three to four months, and that just allows us to do a really good job of ass assessing uncertainties. Yeah. Um, we've done rush jobs in a month, yeah. um, but you can't as ascribe the same level of, of confidence and detail to that. Okay, and now is that just like on one well, or is that modeling several different outcomes based on, you know, those and matching the overall model? Or is it like, what is that, what's the scope of that work? Roughly, our work is typically like a pad scale, uh -huh. right? So, so one pad, three, four months, and you kind of get get some real learnings out of it. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Uh, what what do you see maybe down the future in technology? Like, do you see this kind of work and maybe the contribution of uh, maybe adjacent technologies being really exciting? Uh, what 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 do you what do you get excited about that's not branded Resfrac? Well, I'm going to I'm going to plug Resfrac. Of course, yeah. <laughs> of, right, like, but uh, no, I, I think the last year there have been maybe three or four real uh, interesting trends being kind of emerging out of that unconventional region mm -hmm. uh, for oil and gas operators. Uh, one, uh, EOR, right, looking at huff and puff. Uh, a couple of people are even doing like water injection or continuous gas injection, miscible gas injection, mm -hmm. gas fracks energized fracks. I think that's going to be a really exciting place to play. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be uh, a growing interest of the industry. Can your simulation kind of help with those kinds of things as well? Hence the ResFrac plug. Okay, all right, all right, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we, we are fully <laughs> compositional. Yeah. Uh, we can do gas miscibility, we can do CO2 miscibility, etc. Sure. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be a really exciting place to play. I think refracts are coming back. Uh, we get a lot more inbound inquiries about refracts just in the last four months, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, people looking to that, you know, go back into those existing wells. Mm -hmm. uh, Parent-child relationships, uh, at this point, there's no avoiding depletion, right? right. In, in any of our major bi uh, basins, you're going back in, in the presence of depletion. Uh, we just stood up a joint collaborative study with uh, seven operators and us leading the, the study on parent-child relationships and modeling those and looking at mitigation strategies. Which basin? All basins. Oh, so we have Montney, Delaware, Midland, Bakken represented. Yeah. Um, apologize to one of you if I, I missed your basin. But <laughs> uh, seven operators with, uh, I think, 11 data sets yeah. submitted. Uh, and so we have a really nice cross section of the industry across different basins to look at what's driving those parent child relationships that we keep hearing about. Uh, and then the fourth one that I'd em emphasize and I think is really uh, an exciting place that we hear more, particularly oil majors starting to talk about, is enhanced geothermal. Mm -hmm. So EGS, uh, it supplies that base load electricity that uh, is a real shortcoming of, of some of um, the renewable energy push. And as subsurface experts, the oil and gas industry is really well poised to capitalize upon this uh, rev revitalized interest in EGS. So uh, we work with, with one of the top companies right now on it. Uh, we've seen a couple more high-profile projects uh, in the media recently. So Forge and Deep, they all have great acronyms, right? Uh, I think that's a 
space that oil and gas operators are going to start to play in in a big way. And it's something that our software is uniquely c capable of because uh, yeah. it's doing the fracturing, it's doing the reservoir flow, and it's thermo. Yeah. So we can do all the thermodynamics of the simulation. So uh, just kind of summarizing it, you're you're here for uh, you know the exploratory. What could this possibly be? You're here for the you know what did we do in the past and how can we improve it? You're you're here for. Uh, what the future of oil and gas might look like, whether it's uh, you know more hydrocarbon extraction or, or kind of these um, uh, alternative energy sources, at least for direct power source uh, generation. Uh, maybe stepping back, uh, you know, one more one more level. What what do you think is exciting about oil and gas in particular, and do you think it's destined for? Uh, destined for uh, the graveyard or are you, are you excited about like what is happening here and what, 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 what's going to uh, happen in the midterm? Yeah. Well, I mean, front and center, industry is not going away. Yeah. Um, uh, Scott Tinker, Mark Mills, recently in the just couple last weeks, there's been uh, testimonies to the, to the Senate. There's been letters to the DOE. Uh, it's here to stay. I mean, the, the material balance you have to do to think of going into an entirely renewable grid just boggles the mind, right? It just doesn't exist. The, the best quote I heard was carbon neutral is not nature neutral, right? So, you know, every pound of battery takes uh, 500 pounds of mining to produce it. It's not sustainable. So the industry is here to play or to stay. Uh, and what's exciting is the industry is going to continue to evolve we have for the last hundred years uh, and where we're excited to fit into that is to help those operators continue to innovate uh, because over that last hundred years and, and consistently we, we see oil and gas operators innovate in really remarkable ways and uh, I'm just latching onto those coattails because it's so fun to watch. Yeah. Well, Garrett, really appreciate your time today. Uh, excited about what you're doing, uh, taking this industry to the next level, and uh, looking forward to hearing some more news and updates. Yeah, absolutely, Mark, and great to catch up again.